Hello to everybody. Welcome to the National Quilting Circle Q&A. My name is Leah. I am here with Colleen Tauke, and she is here to answer all of your questions. Now, before we were going live, we were talking about this chat box. I want to draw your attention to it. It should be below your video player or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube, and we would love any and all of your questions. So if you're a beginner just starting out and you literally just want to ask, what do I pick up first? That question goes in the chat box. Or if you're working on a very specific project, exactly, and you want Colleen's take on your specific project, you want to put that question in as well. Anything in between, that's what we're here for. That's what Colleen is here for. And with that said, it's time to officially introduce her. Colleen, would you start us out with telling us a bit about yourself? And I know you've got a little preview of a project as well that I'd like you to talk about. Exactly. Well, welcome to everyone out there who is a quilter who, or is a beginning quilter or an advanced quilter. There are so many things that we can learn by sharing information. And I know the last two years have been a little bit tough. Well, we haven't been able to take maybe the classes that we wanted to because in person, a lot of us as quilters, we are very visual learners. So we, when we see something, we, we just absorb it and learn techniques along the way. And if we haven't had that opportunity, we're trying to share that with you here, trying to, to boost your skills, let you know about tools that are available, techniques that make life a little bit easier. I know as a beginning quilter myself, because I came to quilting from a constru garment construction background. Mm -hmm. um, it was almost 20 years ago now that I kind of converted over to quilting. But I know on those very first projects that I was working on, I was given a project to do as a shop sample. That's intimidating because all the quilters that came in that shop were going to see it. Well, Evidently, the shop owner had way more confidence than I had, but she gave me the project and I went home and I worked on it and came back later and someone said, well, you know, making triangle squares, half square triangles with a simple little tool is so easy. And I went, what do you mean with a tool? I was using a big ruler to draw these little bitty diagonal lines across my pieces to make triangle squares or half square triangles. And come to find out there are two or three different brands of this tool, but a quick quarter or a, a seam marker tool like this that is exactly a half inch wide that you could lay across your um, squares to mark on both sides made making half square triangles so easy. But I didn't know about it. And if you don't, well, this is the time to ask those kinds of questions. We want to make quilting fun, an enjoyable experience, because a lot of us don't have a lot of time maybe to, to um, sit down and quilt. And every minute at the machine or in our creative space is so important to us that we want to make that experience really enjoyable for you. So we're here to help you. <laughs> Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know about those hiccups. You've read a, an instruction in a pattern and you have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> Type it in, let us know, and we'll try to do our best to explain it to you. Now, every month on Facebook, or every every other week on Facebook Live, I bring you a small project to work on. And yes, it's January, but we need time to work on February projects. So this sweet little My Woven Heart uh, table topper is going to be the project that I'm going to present tomorrow. So... If you are comfortable making squares and you need to learn about those triangles, how to make half square triangles, um, join me tomorrow and I'll teach you all about it. So we can make this little woven hearts and even the bonus, the pattern comes with instructions for three different sizes. So you get your value on this free pattern tomorrow. So anyway, hoping that you have questions for us out there today. Well, yeah, do we have? We could get some things in the in the uh, chat box. <laughs> we certainly have already. So we're going to get to as many questions as we can in the time we have with Colleen. Uh, and like Colleen said, also, you can just say hi. Let us know where you're watching from. And maybe just let us know the project you're working on, even if you don't have a question yet. One of the most fantastic things about this community is that we do a lot of crowdsourcing in the comment and chat box as well. So ask your questions, but also just let us know what's going on in your quilting life. We always love to hear it. Uh, that said, we're going to jump right in. Sandra's got our first question, Colleen. So right. Sandra wants to know if muslin can be used instead of batting on lap quilts. 
It can. Um, when you put a layer of fabric in the quilt sandwich, so you have your quilt top and your quilt back, but that piece in between, if you put just a piece of fabric in there or a very lightweight piece of flannel, a lot of quilters will call that a summer weight quilt so mm. that you're not adding extra weight to the project, just enough body to kind of give structure and help hold the um, patchwork pieces so that they have some stability. So yes, that easily can be used. I know I have a quilt and it's out of reach right now that my grandmother made for me. Now it is not a fancy quilt. It was literally just squares and rectangles of leftover garment fabrics that she used. She made all of her grandkids quilts like that, but there was no batting layer inside. All she, she actually used an old blanket or an old flannel sheet on the inside of all of our quilts. So they were great for making tents and having picnics and playing with as kids because they weren't extra heavy. And if you're making those maybe to go to a nursing home or as a lap quilt and you don't want to add that extra weight, that is another way to go by putting that lightweight piece of fabric or a layer of flannel inside your quilt. And like Colleen said, we got to think ahead on our project. So it seems a little silly to be talking summer weight right now, at least for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere. But yeah. you might want to get started. <laughs> exactly. We as quilters always need time to finish our projects. So things we start now might not actually get done till May, June or July. <laughs> It's all a process. <laughs> Always thinking ahead. Uh, really thinking ahead on this next one. Nancy's got a question here. Nancy's thinking of buying a new sewing machine to do some free motion quilting and some other projects. What brand would you recommend Nancy look at? Mm, when it comes to brands, um, there are a lot of good brands out there. So it's hard for me to just say this brand only because I own a variety of brands of sewing machines. In fact, I added one to my um, family yesterday and it's a different brand again. So I own everything from a Kenmore to a Viking to a brother to a baby lock. So <laughs> variety is the spice of life. Um, when it comes to wanting to do free motion quilting, these are the things that you may want to take into consideration. You want as much um, space between the needle and the inside portion of your machine. So as much space here as you can afford <laughs> is what it comes down to. You also either want to have either an extension table that wraps around the machine or the ability to sink it into a cabinet. Because when you're doing free motion quilting, the most important thing I think for, for quilters, and they find this very commonly, is to have the ability to slide our project across the surface. Anytime there's a drop in elevation, say you have an extension or a just a machine with this a little clip around um, piece that fits around here, you have that drape, it's a lot of tug and pull. It makes it harder to control the fabric under the needle. So an extension bed or a way to sink it into a cabinet is something to consider. The other thing is that if you're wanting to do machine quilting on your domestic machine and you're going to purchase a new machine, look for either a dual feed option or a walking foot to be either a part of the package or find out how much that additional piece will be. Because in order to do straight line quilting, an even feed or a dual feed foot is going to be vital so that the layers of your quilt don't shift as you do free motion quilting. Now, if all right, and when you're doing a straight line quilting, not free motion, but straight line quilting, Sometimes those feet are included. Other times those are options. You have to purchase those separately. And they can be anywhere from $100 to $300 as an, ex an additional accessory to your machine. The other thing you want to look for is the, um, is the uh, free motion foot or a darning foot. Now let's see if I can actually locate mine quickly in here. And I don't know if I have my dual feed or my free straight line quilting. I don't. It's upstairs. I was using it recently, but for um, the free motion that gives you the ability to just drop the feet dogs and move your quilt yourself, you're regulating the stitch yourself. You need to have a foot that either is a U shape like this. And if I put my hand behind it, maybe you can see it better in the camera like this. So it has kind of a hopper foot. It has the ability to move 
um, around the fabric and it's very small at the base so you can really see where you're going um there are other shaped ones out there there are plastic ones that are cup shaped kind of dome shaped and those also slide and glide over your quilt sandwich very easily so make sure that those are either included or find out how much an additional cost might be because these are what you're going to want to be using to do that free motion quilting um, on the machine the other thing is see if you can actually sit down to the machine and try it because the sound of the machine and how it manipulates and where the buttons are on it you want to be very comfortable with because machine quilting does take time you're going to spend a lot of time with your machine <laughs> so the sound of the machine the way it manipulate how you manipulate the fabric under the machine those all need to be things you feel comfortable doing you gain confidence by practice and at the beginning it does seem a bit daunting maybe but you do graduate fairly quickly with practice on that and doodling and practicing those kinds of the kinds of stitches and designs you want to create so when it comes to brands that's the other thing like i said the biggest throat plate area here is going to be vital so look at your budget see what you can afford then start to shop online for the biggest space here so that as you manipulate your your quilt top through the machine, this gives you the most space um, available. So there are good machines and in all of the different brands out there. I mean, Janome, Baby Lock, Viking, Brother. Um, there are maybe some higher end Singer machines that might also be very comfortable. I just haven't used those very much. Um, trying to think of any other brands. Bernina has always been a, a good machine, um, but if you get to try it out, that's vital, I think, to being comfortable with your, your purchase in the end. So consider all of those things and then see if you can possibly get in and try out a machine before you purchase. Or if you're purchasing from secondary market, um, crowdsource here, ask people what kind of machines they like. I mean, I've used everything from Baby Lock. Um, I've used Faf. I've used Brother. Um, those are they're. Um, I've used the Viking machines. They're, they're all good. You just need to get to that size of machine that helps you manipulate your quilt the best. All right, a couple things from the comments section before we get into our next big question. Uh, the first one kind of tags on to what you were just talking about, Colleen. So Victor wanted to add that you can use turtle wax on your extension table and it helps to slide your fabric when you're doing the free motion. I see you nodding. Do you have thoughts? That is, that's another way to do to, to help give a sheen or a slipperiness to the surface that you're working on. There are also things that you can purchase. Like um, I think there's called a, it's called a slider. If I remember right, it's um, a vinyl kind of, remember when we were kids and we did, um, it looked like paper dolls, but they were plastic little um, stick together layers that was almost like a window cling. Mm -hmm. um, there are pieces like that that you can even put over the base of your sewing machine also to help give that slickness to the base of your sewing machine. So there are, as quilters, we're always trying to find way other things to purpose like wax would work on there um, but there are things out in the quilt market as tools that you can use also use to to make that free motion go more smoothly all right a few hellos from the chat box as well we have deborah watching from westminster south carolina oh. vicky says hello to everybody working on a scrappy quilt using paper piecing just listening in for now so maybe vicky will have some questions later uh, Darlene is working on her first attic window. And then we've got a couple questions to get to. So hello to all of you watching. Uh, if you didn't hear at the very top of the hour, we're here with Colleen Tauke. She's answering all of your questions. Nothing too fancy from us. So any questions that you have or comments, just drop those right into the chat box and we'll be getting to as many as we can in the time that we have. Now our next one, Colleen, is a little bit uh, detailed. So I'm gonna throw it all at you. And then okay. if we need to take it piece by piece, you let me know and we'll go back through it. So this comes from okay. Julia. Julia says, I want to use the backing to bind my sister's quilt. Is it possible to fold over the backing to the front of the quilt, turn under the raw edge and stitch it down? Talking about using the excess of backing around the edges of the quilt. Also, how would I go about mitering the corners and do the corners have to be mitered? 
So where are we headed first? <laughs> okay. The backing most definitely can be used to wrap around the outside edge of your quilt. You're going to need to trim the batting to about an eighth of an inch or so um, of the, the edge of your actual quilt top. So make sure that as you're trimming your batting, you don't bite into that backing fabric because you don't want to damage it. So do that very carefully. And then you'll need to figure out um, the width that you want your binding to be. And it might take just a little bit of a scrap of a sample to make sure that you get it to the width you want and what looks good with your quilt. Um, binding doesn't always have to be a standard, you know, cut at a certain size. It can be anything you want it to be. So understand there's no quilt police that's going to come and say, no, that was wrong. <laughs> um, finishing quilts is the most important thing being done. So, um, but by figuring out the width that you want that binding to be, you'll want to probably turn it twice so that it's the raw edge goes under a quarter inch. And then again, as it rolls to the front of your quilt, do keep in mind that your patchwork quilt top has a quarter inch on that outer edge that is considered to be the seam allowance. So you want to bring that folded edge of your backing about a quarter inch onto your quilt top. And that should be where that fold ends up um, kind of residing. If you go any further into the quilt top itself and you have any triangles or design elements on that outer edge, it's gonna interfere with points. So it, I'm sure that makes more sense to maybe the person that specifically we're talking to, but um, be thinking about that. If you have a solid border piece, then it may be not so critical as to where that fold you know, ends up exactly. But um, mitering the corner is going to be kind of like wrapping a present. <laughs> so you're going to want to do that on a scrap to figure out the, the whole mechanics behind it. Because what you're going to do is you're going to be folding the corner. Let's see if I can come up with an example here. Piece of fabric. Um, so say that your quilt top resides. Let me make sure I have it on the camera here. Okay, your quilt top is in here. And this is the excess fabric that you're wanting to roll toward the center to finish your quilt top. What you're going to be doing is fold, taking that corner and folding it in like this. Now, I don't have numbers figured here, but this is a basic concept. Um, you're going to fold this in at a 45 degree angle, and then you're going to fold this twice. And I have this little bigger because I need to be able to show you on camera. But you fold it twice on this side and twice on this side, and you'll make a miter, kind of like a picture frame corner there so that as you stitch this finished you'll get to that corner and then switch directions to, to um, stitch that down so you can make that mitered corner you may want to go back and hand stitch that actual miter there just so there isn't a catch space what sometimes quilters will call a toe catcher we don't want to think anything to damage the quilt so if there is a gap there it could catch on something so usually we come back and kind of close that up with tiny stitches. But that's it, the basic thing that you're going to want to do. Now, that triangle that you turn in toward the center may be too long. You may need to trim it and leave about maybe half to a quarter inch of kind of a fake seam allowance. It's kind of a turn under there. So you may be taking off this um, kind of the remainder piece of this triangle, but then the double turn until you get that into a miter to create that corner. So that is a way of using um, the backing to create binding or finishing for your quilt. Now, do you know that when you do it this way, that means there's only one layer of fabric along the outer edge. The quilt will can wear a little bit more. And remember that reference I made to that quilt that my grandmother made me? That's how she finished our quilts. And so this is where my quilt wore the worst. Though we did drag them everywhere, indoors, outdoors. They were for picnics and they were for making tents and they were well loved. And But this is the area that wore the most. By not using the double fold, French fold kind of binding, it does tend to wear on that edge the most. So just keep that in mind. But, you know, quilts, if they wear out, you just get to make more. So that's okay. Now, they don't have to have a mitered corner. If you wanted to just double fold, one side and then come and double fold the other side you can do it that way also you would stitch along one edge and then start again and stitch from this edge out you may want to kind of close up that end it may get kind of thick in that area 
So be careful as you stitch through that with your sewing machine because you're gonna have a lot of thicknesses of fabric and you don't wanna break a needle. <laughs> That's the last thing we as quilters want to have happen. So just be thinking that there, there will be a thickness there on the outer edge of your quilt. So miter, you can do. You can do it just a simple fold from each direction. There's really not, not a right or a wrong. I've given you permission to do whatever you feel most comfortable with. Okay, before we move on to our next question, just a heads up, if you are somebody out there that was looking for those brand recommendations, we do have a couple of them dropping into the chat box from our quilters that are watching. So go ahead and scroll through the chat box. A couple recommendations are already in. And if you have your own that you'd like to share, go ahead and drop that as well. Uh, JS has our next question, Colleen. JS says, I am working on a baby size Chanel back quilt. Front is quilting cotton. Back is four layers of flannel. Channel quilting the quilt on the 45 degree angle. And my question is, do I rotate the direction I am sewing with each row or sew all in the same direction? Do you have tips? You probably should. And when you're doing something like this, when you're doing a, a diagonal, you should alternate directions. So for instance, if you are, let me take a bigger, bigger piece for an example here. If you're doing diagonal stitching across a quilt, if you keep going the same direction, it tends to slightly distort the overall project and it kind of gives it a stretch. And then you lose that squareness of your project and your angles no longer are right angles. So whenever you're doing things like that, if you stitch one direction and then come back and again, the other direction back and forth, it tends to keep things a little bit more squared up in the end. If you have to take a break from your quilting because we don't always get to sit and do the entire thing in one sitting. So if you do the stitching and you're working on it and it's like, oops, I need to take a break, put a pin in where you stopped and have the point of the pin going in the direction that you need to stitch next or a post-it note, something so you know which direction to go when you begin again. We always think we're going to remember, but it could be anywhere from two hours to two days before you get back. And having that little direction of the tip of the pin um, will help you remember. And then as you do your project, you'll have a lot more square project when you're done and less distortion. So it's a good question. All right, we have another one coming up. Uh, this one from Dorothy. So Dorothy is making a reversible table runner fall and Christmas. And what pattern do you recommend to use, Colleen? Uh, Dorothy says, I know to meander, but is there another? Okay, so are we talking about how to quilt it or a pat for, because she said meander, correct? Mm -hmm. What pattern do you recommend I use to quilt? Okay, perfect. Um, when you're doing something that's going to be reversible, it makes it a little bit more difficult to be very specific. Like on this quilt project for tomorrow, I had wanted to do cross hatching in just specific areas and not in others. So I'm following the one design on the, on, on the one side of the quilt. And if you have another patchwork design in the back, it's not gonna line up properly. So meander is a good choice. Cross hatch the entire project so that it's going across everything evenly, not maybe being so aware of the design on either side, just put a cross hatch design, maybe every one inch to one and a half inch across that in both directions. It can be channel quilted. Um, meander is a fun thing to do. So I do a lot of times a meander with a loop or um, a simple curl, a curl in and a curl out. And that gives it an overall motion to the quilt. And usually is fairly pleasing to no matter what piecing or patchwork I've done. So those are kind of those middle of the road. They're not the, um, the heirloom fancy quilt in one area kind of design. So um, the other thing you can do is to Google images for um, free motion quilting. There are so many great designs out there and um, machine quilt, long arm quilters who will share their ideas. So have fun. Just set a time limit on how long you look at Google Images because otherwise two hours old gone by and you still haven't gotten to the machine. So, um, but try out some of those um, others besides just meander. If you've done meandering in the past, it's time to add a little bit different to it. Maybe a curl in, curl out. Um, Baptist fan is also another one where you're making arches 
back and forth and it can ride simply over the entire design and it gives motion to the quilt. It's a very classic design. It's been around for years and years and it um, adds another layer of interest to your quilt. So on a table runner, that's a fun place to try out some new things. Okay, let's talk very long term here with our next question. It comes in from Mary and Mary wants to know if you have tips on caring for your quilt to make it last. Ah, okay. When we put a lot of work and energy and love into our quilts, we do want them to last as long as possible. We do want them to be used, so, you know, storing them away and just looking at them doesn't really fulfill their um, destiny very well. So if you're using a quilt, but you want it to last as long as possible, there are a few things to consider. Laundering a quilt is hard on it over time. So if you need to launder a quilt, and I usually tend to kind of push that, um, the time, how often I, I launder a quilt, as long as possible. Quilts tend, unless they're being used by maybe kids where there's going to be food or other kinds of soils that might happen, it, quilts don't need to be laundered too often. But if they're used on a bed and it picks up body oils and things like that, um, invest in a quilt wash product. It has the right kind of sulfates and stuff in it or sulfate free that doesn't damage the fibers as uh, much as detergents that will be used to wash, say, blue jeans and towels, okay? Because we're trying to take away bacteria in there and usually a quilt isn't quite as um, neat as quite that an abrasive a type of soap. So um, there are products online that you can pick up. Um, there are two, two or three different brands out there and at the, you have to Google quilt wash products. I can't come up with their names right offhand. One comes in a bottle, um, another is in like a little pouch and, and for the life of me can't come up with the names right offhand, but they work great on quilts. They remove the soils and things. They don't damage the color um, and are, like I said, less abrasive on the fibers themselves. Now, if it's an older quilt, um, maybe it needs to be washed by hand, like in the bathtub, so that you aren't putting a lot of um, tug and twist on a quilt. Um, some people prefer to use like a front loading washing machine, like taking it to a laundromat so that it's a front loader, so that it's just gently tumbled and not pulled back and forth like a top loader would do to a quilt. So those are the things to consider. Usually uh, most quilts they would recommend being washed on cold so that heat again is one of those things that um, is harder on quilts. It pulls the dyes out and, and um, can fade our quilts faster. Um, then when it comes to drying quilts, if it's an antique quilt or a hand quilted quilt, um, squeezing the water out as much as you can and then rolling it in towels to take out the excess and even drying it outside in a shaded area can be um, one way to dry a quilt. If you want to dry it in the dryer, put it on that lower setting. Yes, it's going to take more time to dry, but it's less, again, less abrasive, less um, damage to the quilt if it's on a low setting. So cold water, low setting. Pick quilt soap that's made for quilts. It's just a lot more gentle on that piece of artwork that you've created, and it can last a long time. Really, really great question. Um, sure, not just for people making quilts, but <laughs> anybody out there that receives a quilt as a gift. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and if you're gifting a quilt, sometimes actually including how to wash a quilt. I know when my college kid came home, my oldest came home the very first time he brought home his quilt and he's like, mom, I'm not touching this because I'm afraid I don't know what to do with it. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Here's the instructions on how to wash a quilt. And you know, he knew enough that he might not have the, the, the knowledge and to ask, but sometimes when you gift a quilt, people don't think about that. So mm -hmm. including you know, how to wash and care for a quilt is just a generous thing to do when you gift a quilt. I love that. Okay, we've got two questions on a similar topic. So I'm going to start first with Christina's, it's more specific. Christina wants to know what type of thread should I use to attach flannel binding to flannel backing? Um, the same kind of thread you use to piece your quilt. Um, we tend to use a, a 40 or a 50 weight thread. Um, so any, whatever thread you're using to piece your quilt is the kind of thread that I 
tend to use to, to finish that binding by hand. Just make sure the stitches are fairly close together so that, again, we don't have a gap as you roll your binding to the back side. You don't want to have a place where your finger will catch and those nice tight stitches will keep the binding rolled to the back side and secure the outer edge. But um, I tend to use um, a polyester type thread. Some people prefer to use 100% cotton. So that's, that's a personal choice. There are quilters out there who say 100% quilt cottons to piece, 100% cotton batting, 100% cotton backing, 100% cotton thread. That's fine if that's your choice. But there are also other good threads out there that are a polyester thread. Um, some will claim that polyester thread will damage fibers over time. Most of the quilts I'm making aren't going to last 100 years. <laughs> and I don't expect them to to last 100 years. So if you're making an heirloom quilt that you want to last for forever and be handed down, maybe you want to stick with 100% cotton. But um, most quilts that we create in our lives, we want to be loved and used. So whatever you're using for your patchwork is the same kind of thread that you can use for your binding. Okay, let's stick on flannel backing with our next question. This comes from Heather. Heather just wants to know if there are any things that she should consider if I would like backing fabric to be flannel. So anything consideration wise. When it comes to flannel, I love flannel on the back of quilts. You're, you're talking to a person who lives in Iowa and um, the overnight low is going to be 13 below tomorrow night. So flannel all the way. Um, flannels, depending on the grade of flannels here are the things to think about flannels do shrink so if you are buying lower end flannel and i have nothing against lower end flannel they they they're good but they also may shrink at a little bit higher rate than your quilt top so you may want to um, pre-wash everything your quilt top fabric and your backing to get that excessive shrink out of your backing fabric now, when it comes to buying that backing fabric in flannel, you're going to want to buy an extra third of a yard, anywhere from a quarter to a third of a yard from what your pattern suggests as quilt backing so that you make sure that you have enough. If you're taking it to a long armor, they want that extra for the clamps on the long arm. Or if you're doing it yourself, you need enough to, again, the shrinkage out, but still be able to manipulate your quilt top and your sandwich on the backing fabric. Um, the other things to think about when buying backing fabric, whether it's flannel or even just quilters cotton, is what color thread you're going to quilt with. Because um, say you've made a red, white, and blue quilt, and you want to use a navy blue on the back. Now, these are things to consider. You may want to um, quilt, or you thought about quilting with white. What will it look like on the back? On flannel, it will sink into the fibers. You won't see the quilting as dominantly as if it was a quilter's cotton. So maybe think also about the color of that backing fabric, but flannels can be um, a fun thing to put on the back of quilts. And then if you're going to use flannel also as binding, um, you may also want to uh, make sure that you're cutting your binding two and a half inches. A lot of times patterns will either call for two and a quarter or two and a half inch wide French fold binding. And on flannels, I always default to that two and a half, even if the pattern's called for two and a quarter. It's just that you need that little bit more width to wrap around the layers to get to the, um, the back nicely. So I always think uh, I need just a little bit more for my binding and include that and, and think about that also with the shrinkage possibly of your um, flannel as a back. But I love to use flannel on backings. And I have a lot of quilt clients who will, they're like, can I use? And I'm like, oh, sure you can, <laughs> because I do. <laughs> so no problem using flannel as a, a quilt back. All right, first I have to say hello for a moment before we get to our next question. It turns out we have quite a lot of people describing themselves as new or new, new, new quilters. And so hello and welcome. I see comments here from Jan, Marlene, Rekha, Renee, and Helena from all over the world. We've got some Europeans watching, some people from the United States, some people from the Southern Hemisphere. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, all of your questions are here. Colleen is answering them as many as we can get to, and we're having a lot of fun so far. So 
Let's get to another question, Colleen. Uh, we're going to go, let me scroll here and find where I wanted to go next. This comes from Ginger. So Ginger wants to know, Colleen, do you square off your blocks as you sew them? Or do you wait until you've completed all of your blocks before you square them to the right size? It's such a pain to do them all together. <laughs> okay. When it comes to squaring blocks, this has always been a controversy. And it's hard for me. I mean, I guess I think back to when I was a beginner and some of my blocks didn't always turn out exactly the right size that I wanted them to be. And I remember what I used to do. So I guess I'll go there with my explanation. Um, and if my... Uh, if my computer dings, it's my sister and tell her, I'll talk to her later. <laughs> I forgot to turn her off before I started. Uh, and welcome to all those who are new to quilting. We are so glad that you found us. This is a fun place to ask questions. So always feel comfortable. This is your home as your community. Now, when it comes to squaring off blocks, I remember the days when I was very, very new to quilting and I would make a block and I would measure it. It needed to be 12 and a half, say. And I got done and it was kind of 12 and a half, sometimes 12 and three eighths. And I was like, oh, now what? Well, at least I had, I could get the seam allowance in there. My seam allowances sometimes were a little bit thin, but what I would do is I would cheat and I would take my ruler to the back of my quilt and I would draw in my stitching line so that I would get a 12 inch block if my block was a little bit too small. Now, if your block is too big, big. This is something else we need to address. Maybe we need to go back and double check our cutting because accuracy in the cutting is vital to getting the right size when we're finished. So if our blocks are varying, say if we're repeating, and, and a lot of times the variation may come when you're making a variety of blocks because there's different amounts of seam allowances within that block. Say you make a nine patch and so you've only got two seams going each direction. Not too much area for maybe a, a variation there. But if you get over to making um, some really complex block that has um, star or these uh, flying geese pieces in it, and you've got a lot of areas that you could be off just a little bit. If your blocks are being too big, double check your, your cutting as you go. Really be careful on your cutting. And... I've been quilting for maybe 20 years now, and I still, as I cut, when I lay things down on my fabric, I am literally, <laughs> you you aren't here, but this is what's going on in my head. I'm laying it on there thinking, I need a two inch strip, right? I'm literally in my head going one inch, two inch. I'm always, you know, measure twice, cut once, because if I'm off there, then it's going to throw everything off and I'm going to have problems getting my blocks to be the right size. So always double check and making sure that you're very as accurate as possible. The other thing is even the, the way that you hold your um, rotary cutter can get you off by just a little. And, and when I say a little, I'm saying an eighth, an eighth of an inch. But if you have five seams across something and you're off an eighth on all of them, you can be off by five eighths by the time you get done because there's a multiplying factor in there. And it may not happen in every cut, but every once in a while, if you get, if when you take your blade up against your ruler, if you're angling it, if it's not perpendicular to your cutting surface, you're going to get a variation in your cutting so that your blade may be a little further away from the ruler than it needs to be if it's angled toward your ruler. So make sure that you're really keeping that rotary cutter perpendicular to your cutting surface. So you get as accurate a cut as you possibly can. Also double check your quarter inch seam allowance. I know when I started, I'd been, I've been sewing since I was eight years old. I knew what a quarter inch looked like. Yeah, I didn't really know what a quarter inch looked like. <laughs> I thought I did. I was really overconfident <laughs> and I learned really quick that my quarter inch was closer to a three eighths inch seam allowance than a quarter. And that throws off the engineering because as designers write patterns, they're figuring for an accurate quarter inch. And they consider and test all that math for us. 
that's why we love pattern writers <laughs> because we don't have to do the math. If you want to become a pattern writer and, and you want to do your own, that's good. You probably love math, but you, if you're trusting the pattern that you have, the math has been done for you. So you need to have as accurate a quarter inch seam allowance as possible. So maybe you need to double check to see your quarter inch actually measures a quarter inch and it's not a little bit generous. Um, there are feet that you can get um, for your machine. You can get a quarter inch foot that's narrow at the front. So you get a really accurate one or you can get a quarter inch foot that has kind of a blade, kind of a, a, what I call a bumper along one side. So there's a blade along the right hand edge of the foot. If you're new to quilting, this might be a tool you want to use. But remember that when you're putting your fabric under the presser foot and you've got that bumper, don't jam it in there so tight that it rolls up onto the bumper because then your seam allowance is going to be too wide. It wants you to ride next to it, not up into it. So make sure that you're using that foot properly if you're using that as a quarter inch guide for yourself. Now, a lot of people will use those feet for a while and then it becomes very common. They know what a quarter inch looks like. They know where on their machine um, that quarter inch needs to be and they kind of go away from using that foot. That's totally fine if that's you. Other people, they use the quarter inch for their entire quilting career. So that can also help with the, the um, accurate quarter inch seam. Now, if you've got blocks that you've put together and you've got a variety and you need them to be exactly 10 and a half or 12 and a half, you can go and trim the outer edge. But remember that if there are any points, any areas where triangles come to that outer edge, it's been engineered for a quarter inch seam allowance along that end, uh, outer edge, you may lose points if you trim excessively. <laughs> so always be thinking of measuring out from the center out. Don't try to just, um, now let's see if I have uh, example. This is just a little square, a little patchwork block that I was working on this morning. You don't want to just trim along two sides because they're going to be shoving the design all in one direction and you may lose points along two sides. You will have points maybe along the other two sides, but your, your patchwork may not line up with what goes next to it. So always remember to measure kind of out from the center so um, that you get an accurate piece there. But if you can just practice that cutting for accuracy and that accurate quarter inch seam, you should get as close as possible to having the block size that you want. It doesn't always happen. There are times when, or when uh, a pattern calls for making a block a bit oversized to trim them down. Now there are processes and I'm going to be teaching, I, I've taught the process before of trimming um, half score or half score triangles so that you oversize them and then sweep, cut them out nicely and trim those edges so you have perfectly squared blocks. But some people like to trim as they go. Other people like to leave them to the end. And that's a personal preference. Now for me, I tend to leave them to the end. I press everything. And if I'm going to be going back and trimming to make sure they're perfectly squared by using maybe a, um, a triangle trimmer tool or something. I tend to put on a really great podcast or some really great music and then the time just flies. Or I load everything up onto my little mat to take to the living room and turn on my TV show, favorite television show. Because in that trimming process, you're gonna have to use the TV as a radio because you do wanna be aware of where your fingers are at all times when you're cutting. So don't get so involved that you injure yourself. But um, I tend to maybe bring those projects or those trimming things together and try to find a, a, an audio kind of distraction so that I am always thinking about where my fingers are because I kind of like them. <laughs> Most of us have a few background TV shows that we like to have on while we're doing chores. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes the time go so much faster. <laughs> it really does. Um, let's go to uh, one of our new quilters for the next question. And this is from Renee. Uh, Renee just wants to know, Colleen, what is your favorite go-to rotary cutting ruler? Rotor uh, when it comes to rulers, oh, I have so many in my collection. Um, <laughs> I have the Fonz and Porter uh, 8 by 14. I like this because I can fold the width of fabric and do a half fold and it goes cleanly across. It's not quite as big to maneuver um, cutting smaller things. Um, 
and that's by Omnigrid. I absolutely love, and I think I have it below me here. Here we go. The Quilter Select Rulers. This is, if I could replace all my rulers, shh, don't tell anybody. But my dream would be to replace them all with Quilter Select. They have a frosted um, a texture to the backside. And when you place this on fabric to make a cut, it does not slide. It is amazing. So if you have issues at all with dexterity or holding um, rulers steady, because a lot of times as we cut across a wide ruler like this to do the width of fabric folded from, from, from fold to salvage, we tend to get kind of a twist and getting those strips cut across, the ruler just tends to want to walk off to the edge. The Quilter Select Ruler, mm, the Cadillac of rulers. <laughs> um, this, this kind of ruler does not move. There are grips that you can put on the back of rulers. So if you have you know, a collection that you can't replace at this point, you can put um, sticky tabs on the back. You can put a, um, a film on the back. I've seen um, sandpaper dots on the back to help with twist on rulers. Uh, those do help, but the they leave a little gap between your ruler and your fabric, and the quilter select will lay flat on the fabric and hold it still. I didn't want to like them as much as I do, and the first time I tried, it, I was like, "Really? Oh my gosh, yes!" <laughs> so quilter select is probably my absolute favorite. But I have Omnigrid. I have Creative Grids rulers that I like. They do have a built-in kind of textured grip on them. Um, the differences in rulers, here's something to consider. Now, some people's eyes have issues when it comes to color on the rulers. There are brands that have orange markings. There are rulers that have yellow markings and others that are just black and white. If you have issues with those colors, maybe you need to go to just the black and white. So it may differ by your um, you know, vision of what is most comfortable for you to use. So just know that there are things out there that if you're having issue with a color on a ruler, there are ones out there that don't have a color to them. And those can, can assist you in your quilting and cutting also. So, but I have a, a, a whole selection of rulers in my stash. <laughs> All right. Well, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but this is time for my final little warning here. We are well into our last quarter of the hour, which means if you've been hanging on to a question, this is when you wanna drop it into the chat. We will get to as many of the remaining questions as possible, but things are getting a little tight. So I guess that means you'll just have to come join us for the next one, yeah. right, Colleen? Exactly. <laughs> Let me get together, because I, and, and if you are new to watching, um, you will find that I tend to go back and say hello to everybody and give comments because I love to find out where people are watching from because it brings the world into this small group and we get to hang out together. So it's fun. Yes, please drop your final questions in. Uh, Colleen, we'll see them even if we don't answer them today on this session. Uh, Petunia has our next one that we're gonna get to though here. And Petunia wants to know if it's possible to do machine quilting using a template without breaking the needle so that I can get lovely designs like a long arm makes. I'm getting tired of this stippling design. <laughs> yes, there <laughs> is a way to do it but you're going to need um, rulers that and a foot that is made for doing that process. Now there are two or three, at least two or three different companies that make rulers that you will want to use with your um, domestic machine. Now rulers that we use like these that we use for cutting are fairly thin and the hopper foot or the foot that you put on your machine will jump onto these and you will damage or break a needle and dam possibly damage your machine. So these rulers are out, okay? It's, it's gonna be time to invest in new rulers that are thicker. The style that long armors use, they're a thicker plastic. They're acrylic, but they are a thicker um, uh, density than the ones that we use for rotary cutting. The other thing that you're gonna need to invest in is the foot that will ride up against that because the little darning foot or hopper foot that we can put on to do like stippling, these are very thin and 
don't ride properly against that ruler. So there are, um, it's a foot that's either, that's round. It's similar to the foot that's on a long arm machine and it's got a ring here. So it's a circle and it's fairly thick so that when it rides up against the ruler, it stays along the edge of that and it won't hop up and down because this is made with a spring so that it can um, move along um, and allow the fabric to flow underneath. So you're gonna need to find, and I know they come in low shank and high shank, and I think there's maybe even one more. So you're gonna need to do a little bit of investigating to what style of foot you will need to add to your machine. Um, and brands of those rulers, I the one that comes to mind that I've seen used um, is the Westerly rulers. So those are available out there for doing a lot of different designs. You can get also get the foot that's appropriate for your machine. So it will ride against that ruler. I believe there are at least one or two other companies that make those also. So depending on where you are at and what's available in your area. But know that you will need to put a different foot on your machine and you will need to um, invest in those other rulers that are thicker so that you can do those kinds of um, heirloom, fun little designs. There are rulers out there for helping you make heart shapes, circles, overlapping circles, almost like mm, when we were kids and we used a spirograph. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can do those overlapping rings and stuff. There are some really beautiful designs that you can create with those kinds of rulers. So if you have the ambition, go for it. <laughs> okay, cool. let's, jump, <laughs> let's jump over to Vicki's question next. Uh, Vicki's watching from snowy ohio so welcome and hello vicky <laughs> she is a beginner working on her first quilt and vicky says my top is a little wavy what can i do to fix the ripples before i add the borders okay depends on where the ripples are at <laughs> um i would turn the quilt over and look at the back and see if there are issues like with the width of your seam allowance Sometimes we get a little bit off on our seam allowance and it, it can start out at a quarter and then it goes a little narrower or a little wider. And whenever there's a variation there, it will cause that ripple in the seam. Um, the other thing you can do, and I've done this on client quilts, I've done it on my own quilts because I had a little bit of issue here and there, is to use a spray sizing or a spray starch, mist it very lightly. And sometimes those wavy areas will relax a bit. Um, I would avoid trying to steam or overpress an area because you can't even distort it further. But by misting it very lightly with a spray starch or a spray sizing, sometimes it absorbs that moisture and then that relaxes the fibers and things will lay down flat for you. Um, if the outer edge is, is wavy, but the center is fairly smooth, it may be that one of the borders or an inner border may have gotten distorted in, in the attaching process. So um, looking for um, instructions on how to apply binding or borders, how to measure properly in order to fit your borders to your quilt. Now, instructions are wonderful. Designers give you the numbers and how what should fit to everything that you create, but because we are all unique and all of our patchwork is unique, your center of your patchwork may not be exactly the same size as the designer intended originally. So therefore the borders might need to be adjusted. So say I made my quilt and it ends up maybe half an inch smaller than the, than the original should be, or the intended design should be but I cut my borders the same as the designer said to, to cut them. Well, they're gonna be a little long. And if I think, well, I'll just stretch my quilt top to accommodate that border. Now I've distorted that edge by trying to stretch it to fit. And at that point, you don't do that. <laughs> it, it, it just makes things harder on yourself because that gives that ripple on the outside edge. Measure your actual quilt top when you're finished. Measure. And there's three places that you should measure, and this is this is the process. Um, measure down through the center of your quilt top, then measure each side along here. Add those numbers together. I know this is math and everybody's eyes are rolling back in their head, but measure down through the center, measure along each side, add those numbers together and divide by three because you took three measurements. 
that will give you the average. That's what you can kind of square your quilt top up to be. So cut the side borders that that's that length. Now do the opposite for the other direction. Measure down through the center, measure both edges here. And again, if you have to change that number in the cutting, do so. But it, it will fit your quilt much better. I've had quilt clients and I've even had a quilt client who said, here's the quilt top center. Here's the border fabric. Will you just put the borders on because I'll mess it up? <laughs> because when she gets going on her border, she tends to just cut strips and then just sew them on. And as she's sewing, she's tugging and doesn't realize it. And it gets longer and longer and longer. And the outside edges tend to go kind of too loopy, kind of on the outside edge. And then it's very hard to, to lay flat to do the machine quilting or the long arm quilting. So at that point, you, it's kind of like going to your hairdresser. You just got to be really honest <laughs> about what size your quilt is. It don't have to tell anybody if it didn't measure what the designer intended. It's your quilt. <laughs> just take those measurements and make those borders fit your quilt instead of trying to stretch them because that tends to be where we get issues. So just measure, oh. be honest. <laughs> All right. I'm going to finish off with a pretty general question, but uh, one that we haven't really touched this subject yet. And it comes in from Lori. And Lori is wondering how we should fold and store our quilts. Ah, that is a really good question. Because Yes, right now we're using all of our quilts in the Midwest to keep warm so we don't freeze to death. But come July, when it's 85 outside, I'm not going to have three quilts on my bed and they're going to have to go into the cupboard or into the closet. So, okay, we're going to pretend this quilt is a large bed size quilt. We tend to want to do this just fold the quilt up and put it in the closet, right? Well, if we always fold in the same places over and over, the wear on those edges and a stretch. Um, trying to think. This this quilt even has kind of a crease across it because it was upstairs earlier this morning. And it's been folded for a while. So it kind of got a stretch, that area where it rounds around that fold and it gets distorted there. So if you do fold it like this and put it in the closet, every once in a while I'll take it out and fold it a different way. Now, when I say fold it a different way, it's not to fold it this way because you're going to be on the same folds. It's to do something like this. Fold it diagonally. Be, be, be just a little bit rogue. We don't have to fold our quilts square. We can fold them any direction we want so that you kind of change that fold spot over and over so that it's not always in the same place. Because if it's a king size quilt or even a, a double bed size quilt, it gets thick after you fold it a couple of times and that stretching around that fold kind of pulls on all those fibers in that place. And if it's gonna be in there for six months, that's a lot of stretch over time. And then when you take it out, you kind of have this bubble and you're like, uh-oh. <laughs> so every once in a while, take your quilts out and refold them in a different direction. You know, it, it doesn't have to be in corner to corner. It can be off this direction, just so that those folds tend to fa fall in a different place each time so that you have the amount of stretch kind of gets laid out over the entire quilt. Plus, when you take them out, you get to enjoy them and pet them and remember what you've put away. <laughs> I have to say, you kind of just blew my mind with that. <laughs> So if you ever add, you know, cut your wrapping paper too small, you know, Christmas just got over and I was wrapping something even the other, um, for Christmas time and I cut the paper too small and it wouldn't go this way around. And I'm like, wait a minute, if I put the present this way, I could still get the paper to fit. Who says it has to be square on there? So your quilts can be folded that way too. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, that is a great tip to end on. Uh, Colleen, I'm going to give you time for just a few final thoughts and then I'll have a few reminders myself before we send everybody on their way. So Colleen, you first. Okay. Well, welcome to those who are new quilters and those who are intermediate quilters and those of you who are so seasoned, you could probably teach me some things. So make sure you share it with us. I am so glad that you could join us. Um, Realize Facebook Live is every other week. We have small projects so that Woven Hearts will be the project tomorrow. There are all kinds of free projects. There are videos. There are so many things loaded at our website. 
go in and have some fun and pick up a new skill along the way. We really enjoy having you here. Absolutely, we do. And like I said before, any questions that we didn't get to today, please come back. You can ask them again. I know Colleen's going to be able to see them in the chat box as well. Uh, there are a couple nice ideas in here, Colleen, maybe for ideas for future tutorials as well, some of the questions. <laughs> so if you have something you want to see from Colleen, please feel free to drop that in the chat as well. Like Colleen said, every other week, there's something going live. So there's a plenty of time to check in with all kinds of different projects. And the one that Colleen just told you about, our team has dropped a link to that into the chat box for you. So if you want to come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central, that is Colleen's live demonstration for the project that is right in front of her, My Woven Heart Mini Wall Hanging. It looks fantastic. It's going to be a little ahead of that February holiday, like we said, getting, getting ahead of the game a bit. And Colleen would love to see you there. And we would love to see you for our next Q&A. So please keep your eyes peeled for that as well. On behalf of Colleen and the entire team, thank you so much for joining us today. And until next time, happy quilting.